This is a recording of the 10th Scuba Global Science Week, TGSW 2020, Session 62, How Can Constitutions Deal with COVID-19? I'm Hajime Akiyama, Assistant Professor at the University of Tsukuba. I'm an organizer of this session, and I moderated this session. This session was held on 29th of September, 2020. Since there are technical problems, I am re-recording my introduction and my presentation, which is the first presentation in part two. I apologize for the participants for technical problems. Let me begin my introduction. COVID-19 is a global issue today. And as the opening plenary of the TGSW 2020 indicates, many states are struggling to deal with it. One difficult issue is the relationship between civil liberties and their restrictions. Constitutions in many states value civil liberties, but to prevent spreading COVID-19, restriction levels of civil liberties, such as freedom of movement, may be necessary. In such circumstances, there are many questions. To what extent should civil liberties be restricted under the name of emergency measures? Is it possible to interpret that emergency measures are securing the right to health? And how can constitutions deal with COVID-19? I organized this online session to tackle these questions. In order to compare the role of constitutions globally, we have presentations on France, Switzerland, the US, and Japan. Many perspectives need to be considered to think about the reaction to COVID-19, so we have discussions from perspectives of comparative law, public health, and politics. I hope this online session provides an opportunity to consider the Constitution's role in dealing with COVID-19. This session is organized as a part of TGSW, which the University of Tsukuba hosts. It is partly supported by the research support program to tackle COVID-19 related emergency problems, University of Tsukuba. Let's move on to presentations. The first presentation is from the French perspective. The presenter is Professor Marie-Laure Pazilingensch. She's a professor at Jean Moulin Lyon Three University. The title of the presentation is The French Constitution Facing COVID-19 Crisis, How the Exceptional is Made Normal. Sounds stimulating. Professor Bazilin Gaines' presentation begins. Thank you first for inviting me uh, to this um wonderful session and I will share my PowerPoint now so you can see the um, slides of my presentation is that okay for you can you see it now yep you can yes. okay so in order to deal with this subject the french constitution facing COVID 19 crisis uh, my point is um, rather clear uh, that is the um, exceptional is made normal actually in france uh, we have actually like a second phase of the COVID-19 crisis in France, like a second wave of the contamination, and we still uh, are facing health issues. And to face, uh, to cope with the COVID-19 crisis, the French Parliament adopted uh, on 23rd March 2020, an act creating a new emergency power regime that will be used until April the 1st, 2021, what I will call the state of health emergency. This state of health emergency was activated the very same day by the act itself and extended by an act of 11th of June 2020 and on 9 July 2020 an act managing the way out of the state of health emergency was supposed 
to apply until 30th of October 2020. So we have like a multiple layer of state of emergency actually in France. First, the traditional state of emergency that was used during more than two years after the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris. Afterwards, the normalized rules established by the state of emergency were adopted on October the 30th of 2017 with the act reinforcing the interior security and the fight against terrorism. We have third, the state of health emergency created by law on March of this year, which was activated and with, will be uh, extended. And since July 10th, 2020, we have the application of a very odd, very strange uh, regime that organizes the way out of the state of health emergency. It's quite like a state of health emergency without this name, but with all is content. So exceptional in France is the new normal. To deal with all these points, I just want to underline two ideas. The first idea is that we have some doubts about the necessity of this new legislative regime. And the second point is uh, that I am not the alone, and we are many scholars, whereas about this impact of this new legislative regime on rights and liberties. So let's begin with the first point. This uh, doubtful necessity of this new regime of state of health emergency appears because we have used existing legal tools uh, in order to cope with COVID-19 during the first weeks of the crisis. Uh, where used at that moment, the health emergency powers, the health ministry disposed of according to the law, according to article L31311 of the public health code. And we have the exceptional circumstances doctrine, that is a jurisprudential doctrine that appeared uh, during World War I. Uh, it seems quite odd to use such exceptional circumstances doctrine, but it was used uh, by the governmental decree of 16th of March 2020, because this decree was not only a decree of the Minister of Health, but also a decree of the Prime Minister. In fact, the general administrative police power of the Prime Minister would have sufficed to justify such a decree. Um, so uh, we used uh, existing legal tools, but the idea was to create a new legislative disposal to create the new state of emergency, to create this health emergency power. Uh, the idea of creating it uh, results that um, it's more a symbolic legitimation of the government powers to cope with the crisis. Uh, in fact, uh, the exceptional power of the president that is recognized in Article 16 of the 1958 uh, constitution is not uh, adequate to cope with um, sanitary emergency. The second idea is that the state of emergency, the normal state of emergency that was organized by the law, the 1955 law to cope with the Algerian independence war was not adapted to the sanitary emergency. So the idea was to create a new state of emergency, the state of health emergency. The act of 23rd of March 2020 created this uh, public um, health state of emergency uh, that was codified in the public health code. Uh, at the beginning, the idea was to dispose of such an emergency powers only in an 
an experimental way until the 1st of April 2121. But uh, the government uh, proposed to make this um, transitory uh, state of exception become a permanent one. Uh, and the health, the state of health emergency regime uh, is particularly um, stringent as it restricted uh, very uh, prominently the rights and liberty of the, um, the people. And we have now, uh, we are now in the regime of the way out of the state of emergency. Uh, it was supposed to end on the 30th of October 2020, but uh, an act was proposed to um, extend it until the 1st of April 2021. So, we have some doubts about the necessity of uh, this new regime because we have many, many regimes that are quite piled up uh, in France at the moment. And uh, we discovered last week that we have different levels of alerts. State of alert, state of reinforced alert, state of maximal alert, state of health emergency. So, the first free state of alerts uh, have no uh, legal basis to be developed upon. Maybe um, the decree that was adopted um, following the law of 9th of July uh, 2020, but it's not quite sure. And the state of health emergency that could be used at the moment is not. And I'm quite puzzled by this no use of state of health emergency that was created in March this year. Here are the presentation of um, the different level of alerts we can see in France at the moment. So the necessity of this regime of the state of health emergency is quite doubtful, but more importantly, I think that um, the point is that this new regime is particularly uh, worrying, concerning uh, relatively to the, its impact on uh, the, um, the balance of powers and the guarantee of liberties. As you must know, Article 16 of the Declaration of Human Rights and the Citizen Rights um, issues, no society in which the guarantee of rights is not assured, nor the separation of powers determined as a constitution. So I'm asking the question, do France, do, does France have a constitution at the moment in so far that uh, we can observe an imbalance of power and a disrespect of liberties. Concerning um, the imbalance of powers, we have to remark that the formal arrangement of the new regime, the state of health emergency, um, is um, worrying because the powers the executive can use to cope with the COVID-19 crisis is particularly vague and white and could be used in a very uh, worrying manner. Um, and um, we have like many powers entitled in the executive with a restricted set of guarantees and the limited control by the parliament that in fact doesn't seem very willing to exert to um, develop his control and the decision the executive uh, adopt uh, concerning the um, crisis of COVID-19 in France. The elements uh, that are uh, upsetting concerns the substantial consequences of the regime concerning the rights and liberties. According to the regime, um, the powers, the ministers in charge of health and the prime minister can use are very restrictive. Uh, I'm going to list some of these powers. Restrict or prohibit the movement of people and vehicles, prohibit people from leaving their homes, order quarantine, 
or isolations of persons likely to be affected, older temporary closures of establishment open to the public, limit even prohibit gatherings on public pathway, other requisitions of goods and services, take temporary control of the prices, take all the measures to make available appropriate medicine to patients and a very wide and very vague uh, power take by decree any other regulatory measure limiting rights and freedom. So we can be uh, very worried as far as the state of health emergency develop a security approach and not a sanitary approach. And we can have some doubts uh, concerning the efficiency of such health emergency uh, state to cope with the sanitary emergency of COVID-19 uh, because there are some restrictions of rights, but we do not have a causality, um, a direct link between the decided positions and measures of the government and um, the limitation of the contamination of the people in France. And facing such uh, wide powers restricting liberties, we have an administrative church that deploys a very minimum control. We can see that um, reading and examining uh, the Council of State decisions, because this one has proven to be a poor guardian of individual liberties. And some people said that it was like a judicial rubber stamping body. To conclude, I wanted to underscore that we have an acute question uh, concerning uh, sanitary emergency. Uh, th this question is how can we ensure balance of powers and guarantee of rights when uh, the state uh, of emergency of sanitary emergency raises. We are in a very strange time uh, when it is not anymore the raison d'état that is used by government, but the raison de la santé, the reason of health that is used to restrict liberties. Uh, and as I said, this is a security and not sanitary approach of coping with a health emergency. Moreover, we can notice that we have like an instrumentalization of the states of emergency because we can notice in France that the state of health emergency was manipulated by the executive authorities, uh, generating uncertainty, plot theories, all the more because these authorities revealed to cover up the inabilities, incapacities, and errors by exploiting legal tools of exception because they didn't organize the public security obligations they have according to the constitutions. And this instrumentalization of the state of exception, the state of health emergency, is like a three-stroke waltz. We can see the same rhythm as we saw with the normal state of emergency. We have first uh, the declaration, second the normalization, and third the banalization. So we are worried all the more that the emergency response to COVID-19 epidemic act also authorized the government to adopt ordinances which should normally uh, fail within the competence of the parliament, but these matters uh, fell because of this uh, act um, in the competence of the government. And some of these ordinances reformed the penal code, the judiciary system, the labor law. So we can see that we have a normalization of the exceptional in uh, France uh, because and in thanks to uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis coped with the state of health emergency. So thank you for your attention and uh, I will be grateful to receive any of your comments and questions.
Professor Basilian Gensh, thank you very much for your um, presentation. Um, Professor Basilian's presentation um, indicates the risks the state of emergency has based on the um, experience of the continuous state of emergency. Thank you very much. Um, the next presentation is the is from the Swiss perspective. Um, let me tell you that the um, city of Tsukuba, where the University of Tsukuba is located, and also a supporter of the TGSW, is a host town of Switzerland for the 2020 Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games. The presenter for Switzerland is Associate Professor Veronique Boyer. She's an Associate Professor at University of Lausanne. The title of the presentation is COVID-19 and the Swiss Constitution. Associate Professor Boyer, the floor is yours. Professor Boyer, I think you are you are on mute. So would you start from the beginning, please? Click once again. Sorry, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I will deal, as you said, um, with the, the question of the, the Swiss constitution and COVID-19. And uh, I will uh, explain you how we deal uh, the situation uh, in Switzerland. So uh, unlike uh, other states, uh, Switzerland uh, seem to be legally uh, prepared for a pandemic. In 2012, uh, the, the Federal Epidemics Act was completely revised. However, uh, the emergence of the new coronavirus was a real life test of the tools and solutions adopted at the time and demonstrated that several aspects uh, remain problematic in our legal system. From a comparative perspective, the state of emergency is regulated in, diff in different ways. First of all, with regard to the competence to identify and declare the state of emergency, a simplified distinction is made between the government model, which gives this power to the government, and the parliament model, which gives this competence to the parliament, at least to some extent. As far as framework conditions are concerned, a distinction uh, must, be, must be made between countries in which the government can act fully and freely without uh, respecting the law and the constitution, and those in which the government uh, remains bound uh, by the law and the constitution. As a federal state, Switzerland also has to handle the question of the vertical dimension uh, of power. And finally, uh, what about the judicial review? Should it be applied on a regular basis or should it be limited? In this presentation, I would like to deal briefly with these different points. As my speaking time is limited, I will now to go back over the history of the Swiss authorities' awareness of the pandemic emergency. I will simply just point out that the first case of COVID-19 uh, was confirmed on 25 February 2020. The new coronavirus then rapidly uh, spread to all parts of the country with rapid increase in the number of infections and deaths. The government first issued an ordinance banning gathering of more than 1,000 people on 28 February 2020, followed by a ban on 13 March on gatherings of more than 100 people, closure of schools, an obligation for contents uh, to provide information on health capacity and measures at the borders. Subse subsequently, almost 40 ordinances were adopted containing both police measures and financial ones uh, in order to address economic and social difficulties due uh, to the lockdown. So I will start uh, with um, 
a first uh, a few words, sorry, with the constitutional uh, and the legal framework. So in emergency situations, uh, several constitutional provisions uh, provide for the rapid adoption of measures. Um, Article um, 173 of the federal constitution gives parliaments the power to take measures to preserve Switzerland's external security, independence and neutrality, and to preserve internal security. However, uh, this emergency clause has not been used uh, for several reasons. In Switzerland, parliaments are not professionals and do not sit permanently. In addition, as you know, it is always complicated to take decision urgently because of the majorities to be found in a parliament. However, even though the parliament was in session, the offices of both chambers decided to suspend the session for sanitary reasons. This decision was heavily criticized and it took until 4 May 2020 for the government to finally put an end to these measures and to call an extraordinary session. Um, the federal constitution also authorizes the federal council, so the government, to adopt uh, independent ordinances based directly on the constitution. Artic articles uh, 140, uh, 84 and 85 give uh, the federal council the power to issue ordinances and rulings where safeguarding, safeguarding the interests of the country so requires or in order to counter existing or imminent threats of serious disruption to public order or internal and external security. In both cases, the ordinances adopted by the government must be limited in time. Indeed, judging that the government uh, tended to make abusive use of its police power, uh, the legislature intervened in 2010 to limit it. Article 7D of the Government and Administration Organization Act stipulate now that such emergency ordinances must be ratified by Parliament after six months at the latest. In other words, uh, the government has the power for a period of six months to declare an emergency on its own, but it remains substantially restricted in its re response. Thereafter, it must obtain the consent of the Parliament. A federal epidemic act was also adopted on uh, 28 September 2012, following the SARS-CoV coronavirus epidemic of 2003. Uh, the epidemic act li lists three types of measures to combat epidemics, distinguish be distinguishing between normal, special and extraordinary situations. In case of extraordinary situation, Article 7 of the Epidemic Act provides that the government can order the necessary measures for the whole country or for individual parts of the country. In Switzerland, the first difficulty was to identify the basis on which the government exercised its competence. Also, the Federal Council specified that Article 7 of uh, the Epidemic Acts was only declaratory and simply repeated Article 185 of the Federal Constitution. Uh, the, the government distinguished between ordinances that had to be based on Article 7 of the Epidemic Acts and those that it adopted directly on the basis of the Constitution. The following criteria were applied. All measures to limit the spread of the coronavirus and to maintain the capacity of the health system, the so-called primary measures, were exclusively based on Article 7 of the Epidemics Act. The measures taken to address the problem arising from the implementation of the primary measures taken under the Epidemics Act have been enacted in separate ordinances. This 
economic and social measures, the so-called secondary measures, were based as far as possible on delegation, delegation norms contained in formal uh, laws. In the absence of such laws, the Federal Council then relied on Article 185 of the Federal Constitution. This classification has been uh, criti criticized by the, the scholars. In particular, the use of Article 185 of the Federal Constitution. Even though this uh, provision aims to protect uh, public order, the government has relied on it to adopt financial support measures. It would have been prefer preferable for the government to have relied on the Epidemic Act, the scope of which um, is better de defined. By relying on Article uh, 185 of the Federal Constitution, the government has set a precedent that can lead uh, to future abuses. Another aspect raised some difficulties. How to terminate the extraordinary situation? While Article 7D of uh, the Government and Administration uh, Organization Act provides for a mechanism to put an end to ordinances based on Article 185 of the Federal Constitution, this is not the case under the Epidemics Act. In practice, however, the government has applied the same regime to all ordinances, which all have been limited to six months. However, the doctrine calls for the, the amendment of the Epidemic Act regime in order to codify this safeguard. A few words now uh, about the limits uh, to the powers of uh, the federal government. The competence of the Federal Council is based on the Constitution or the Epidemics Act and must be uh, exercised in accordance with the legal framework. In theory, the, MNG, the, the emergency power remains respectful of the law, as it only leads to a weakening of the requirements of legality. Indeed, in such circumstances, a serious restriction on a fundamental right may be based on a simple ordinance, namely a law in the material sense. On the other hand, the requirements of public interest and proportionality must be fully respected. In other words, in such emergency uh, situation, the Federal Council has the power to adopt ordinances and may in this context restrict fundamental rights without a formal legal basis. However, it remains bound by the other conditions of restriction. In view of this element, Switzerland has not used the derogation in time of emergency in the sense of Article 15 of the European Conventions or the Article 4 of the UN Covenant. However, uh, if we look at the measures adopted, we can see that the Federal Council has often amended federal law, but has done so in fairly transparent uh, manner by, indi by indicating which provisions of federal law do not apply or apply differently. In this way, the Federal Council gave itself competence that were reserved for Parliament. In addition, several provisions of federal ordinances were in conflict with the Constitution. Certain, de certain deadlines uh, relating to political rights directly uh, established by the Constitution have thus uh, been suspended, and certain measures of the federal government clearly fall within the competence of the cantons. Contrary to conflicts with the federal le legislation, the Federal Council has not uh, discussed uh, these conflicts uh, in a transparent uh, manner. Concerning uh, now the federalism and the, the question of the vertical uh, division of power. Uh, in a federal state that, uh, such as Switzerland, the question of the divis division of competencies uh, between the federal and uh, the state level is of course very important. This, has, this aspect gave rise to some uh, difficulties in practice. In principle, the federal state 
only has limited competence in the health sector. In this sense, uh, the Epidemic Act provides for three level system, which uh, stipulates that in normal situations, the cantons are competent, and only in extraordinary situations does the Confederation, um, the federal state, uh, competent, become competent. We have seen that Article 185, on the other hand, should not allow the Confederation to adopt measures in the area of competence of the cantons. During the health crisis, we have also seen that it was essentially the federal government that took the necessary, necessary measures, which could sometimes be judged in contradiction with the federal constitution. In some cases, the, the government decided to reserve a certain cantonal competencies. This also rose to certain difficulties because it implied interpreting federal provisions to determine sc the scope of, of action of the cantons. In the end, it was neither satisfactory that the measures adopted by the confeder confederation could be considered in contradiction with the constitution because of the divisions of competence, nor was it satisfactory, satisfactory that the federal council's ordinances had to be interpreted to determine uh, whether cantonal regulation was still admissible. This situation undermines the principles uh, of legal certainty and legal predictability. It was therefore proposed that in extraordinary situations, the Confederation should have exclusive competence. In other words, as soon as it is proclaimed, the Confederation becomes slowly competent. It is only with the express authorization of the Federal Council that the cantons should be able to order specific uh, measures. Concerning, um, finally, uh, the judicial uh, review. In Switzerland, the Federal Supreme Court does not have the competence to review the constitutionality of federal normative acts in an abstract manner. In other words, the Swiss judicial system is characterized by the lack of judicial authority to review the abstract constitutionality of federal council ordinances. The constitutionality of a federal norm can only be examined, examined in the context of a concrete judicial review, which means that it is only possible to bring a case before the judicial authorities against a de decision applying the ordinances and in this context to argue uh, the unconstitutionality of the legal basis. Furthermore, Article 83 um, of the Federal Act of the Federal Court excludes ordinary recourse in matters of domestic security. So we can underline that under normal circumstances, the control of the constitutionality of federal acts is already severely limited. And it is even more severely restricted in emergency situation. On the basis of these observations, it is clear that uh, judicial review is not uh, sufficient in this case. It is absolutely not acceptable to open only a concrete review, especially since many measures restricting fundamental rights do not, re do not require any decisions and are therefore very difficult to challenge. Moreover, the concrete uh, remedy is far too time consuming so the constitutionality of government acts based on the emergency provision should be directly subject uh, to uh, judicial review. A few of your words now to, to conclude and to uh, resume uh, all the, the points. Also, uh, Switzerland seemed to be re ready to re respond uh, to health crises such, such as the coronavirus uh, crisis a number of difficulties soon became apparent in practice. First of all, the applicable uh, provisions are not clearly coordinated. In order to avoid uh, misuse of Article 185 of the Federal Constitution, 
the adoption of financial measures should also be possible on the basis of the Epidemics Act. The next step uh, will be to reinforce the role of uh, parliaments. The model provided by Article 7D of the Government Act, uh, which limits uh, the government's regulatory power to six months, uh, seems uh, appropriate to us. It will be necessary to expressly stipulate that it applies uh, within the framework of the Epidemics Act. It could also be possible to involve Parliament at an early stage when the extraordinary situation is declared uh, by means of a commission or a delegation. With regard to the vertical division of power, a centralization of power seems to be highly uh, recommended in ca case of emergency. The unclear distribution of competences undermines uh, the principles of legal certainty and uh, legal predictability, and the differences in tra treatment between the cantons uh, give rise to criticism in practice and uh, were not um, very well accepted by the population. Finally, uh, it seems clear that uh, the judicial control in Switzerland must be improved by allowing uh, abstract and rapid, rapid control of the federal council's ordinances. In this respect, it is interesting to note that unlike in other countries, the measures uh, adopted have only given rise to one legal action to date, a procedure against uh, the obligation to wear the mask, even though many of the measures were uh, clearly contrary to uh, fundamental rights. One thinks, uh, for example, of the asylum procedure, which are the only ones not to have been uh, suspended, even though it was uh, no longer possible to have recourse to interpreters or doctors' expertise uh, for the, the procedure. Finally, we can also note that unlike other countries, the government's legal responsibility was not engage, engaged at any time, even though uh, Switzerland uh, was severely uh, lacking in masks. Only an informal procedure aimed at drawing lessons from the crisis was put in place. But for the rest, uh, it is important to remember that the Swiss government is not politically responsible before the parliament, which also uh, excludes any political uh, sanction. So what's, uh, that's the... the, the, the the presentation of the situation in Switzerland. I hope uh, it, uh, it gives you some uh, new information to, to uh, think about the, the situation and the, the legal um, remedies that can be used and the limits of these remedies. And I'm looking forward to have your comments uh, and uh, your, um, your questions. Thank you very much, Associate Professor Bo. Um, your presentation introduced the uh, Swiss federalism and uh, the issue of balance of power uh, between executive and the uh, federal court, which is really interesting. At the same time, it was really interesting for me to learn that the ordinances maybe may have issues from constitutional perspectives and how special situations and the ex exceptional situation justify such circumstances. Um, I have many questions in my mind. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, next presenter will be, okay, so we have a, the next presentation is from the perspective. Um, the presenter is Dr. Jeffrey Miller. Um, he's a project manager at Academ Academy of in, uh, European Law, European University Institute. He's also an assist, um, assistant professor at Gerodet University. The title of the presentation is COVID-19 and the United States Constitution. I know it should be um, around 2.15 uh, uh, in the morning in Washington, DC. Um, thank you very much for presenting late at night or even early in the morning. Dr. Miller, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate uh, 
Uh, it's a real honor to be here with you today, uh, or this evening in my case. Um, I, uh, I know how much work goes into, uh, or have some sense of how much work goes into uh, organizing events such as this. And uh, uh, so my thanks to everybody who's been involved in the process. I've really enjoyed the presentations uh, up, to, up till now and look forward to the future uh, presentations. Um, and I think what you're going to see from my presentation is uh, that uh, there's a lot of variation uh, in how uh, uh, COVID-19 has been addressed. Um, and uh, I thought particularly interesting based coming on the, on the back of the last presentation about federalism in Switzerland. I think you'll see a very different approach to federalism uh, in mine. So, um, Obviously, uh, we are living through some very unusual times at the moment, and uh, that's true in general, and it's also true uh, for my topic, which is COVID-19 and the U.S. Constitution. Uh, this is a situation which is very much in flux, and as time goes on, uh, it seems to me, at least, that we have probably less certainty about this relationship uh, between the virus and the constitution, not more. Uh, and if you live in the United States, uh, I would say it's very likely that the US constitution uh, has had a, a very direct impact on your life uh, and will continue to. Um, I'm gonna try something a little bit new for me, uh, a little bit of a different approach than I normally take uh, in a presentation. I'm gonna try to explain this uh, from, my, from my, own, my own story, my own perspective on this, uh, with the hopes of making, uh, this, uh, making this topic, which can seem a little bit abstract, uh, uh, more concrete. Uh, so, my story begins this way. Uh, at the end of February, I was living in Italy, and uh, I had been living there for about four and a half years, uh, planning to live there probably for at least another year and a half at the time. Uh, I had planned uh, a vacation to come back to the United States to visit my family. Uh, and uh, had been planned long in advance. And so uh, if you live in Florence, Italy, and you want to go back to Washington, DC, uh, most likely you fly through Germany. Uh, and I can very clearly recall um, sitting uh, on the tarmac uh, in Munich with when my wife turned to me and she said, um, I'm getting all these messages about a virus uh, in Italy, um, what do you know about that? And of course we had been following at some level what would, was going on. Most of it appeared to be happening in China at that time. Uh, and we weren't aware yet that it had become a, much of an issue in Italy though. Well, what, during the time that we were home uh, back in the United States visiting family, uh, the situation in Italy deteriorated very quickly. Uh, so. Uh, first, there was a, a lockdown uh, of the area north of Florence, north of where I was living. And then shortly after that, the entire country uh, went into lockdown, schools closed, only essential businesses, etc. cetera. And uh, we have, I was in contact with people in Italy. Uh, they recommended that we not return. And so uh, in the end, we thought, okay, well, uh, we'll wait a little bit. And uh, when this uh, issue is over with, then we'll return, we thought, within a few more weeks, perhaps. We tried to uh, enroll my daughter in school. She was studying in Italy. And um, for very understandable reasons, uh, the school system was not too excited about having a, a new student coming from Italy. Uh, at that point, uh, Italy really seemed like uh, the area in Europe where all, most of the coronavirus cases were coming from. Uh, in the end, uh, they asked her to stay out of school for uh, several weeks uh, and she attended one day of school uh, before uh, schools closed here in Washington DC as well and around the country. So, uh, 
and we stayed. Um, so a strange thing sort of happened along the way. Uh, initially, it was a liability that we were coming from Italy. Uh, we seemed to be a, a threat because of that. And then it wasn't, it didn't take too long until we were, it appeared to be that we were a threat because we lived in the United States. And, and the reasons for that were quite clear. Um, and uh, I will uh, now start with the, the official presentation here um, of the slides. So here we see uh, sort of my timeline. Um, uh, when I arrived in, in Italy, uh, from Italy, uh, Italy goes into lockdown and the number of coronavirus cases is higher uh, in Italy than it is uh, in the United States. And uh, then you have a lockdown period where uh, it plateaus in the US and then goes up. Uh, and it plateaus in Europe and goes down. Uh, at some point it became clear that it was going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to return uh, to Europe uh, for understandable reasons. Uh, you know, the ban on uh, travel from the US to uh, Europe had, uh, had been extended by the EU and um, it became increasingly clear it was gonna be very difficult to get back home. Um, so, how did we end up in this situation? Uh, and I think uh, there are a couple of issues we could talk about. Um, I'll try to limit myself. I know the time is, is, is somewhat limited here um, to the following. So here are the broad issues I think that, you, that, that can sort of explain what was going on. First is US style federalism. Uh, the second is uh, the tension between individual rights and the common good. And the third, uh, more recently, has been who has the authority to interpret the US Constitution uh, and how, how should the US Constitution be interpreted? Uh, so I'll start with uh, federalism uh, US style. So uh, in the United States, uh, we have a federalist system, uh, federal laws, state laws are and some laws that uh, overlap. And uh, what is challenging uh, for US constitutionalism is that public health has traditionally been a state law issue. Uh, federal law has something to do with it, but not much. Uh, and so um, this was not a great, not a great uh, match for, um, for COVID-19. So uh, I have here on this next slide, um, two quotations. Um, the first one is essentially, it's from the US Supreme Court, basically saying what I just said, but, but more eloquently, uh, you know, public health is a local concern. Uh, the second one I thought was interesting because it's written by a law professor in mid-February, 2020. And uh, she states here that responsibility for, um, for the uh, coronavirus uh, COVID-19 issues are, is going to be divided among 2,684 jurisdictions. And each of these jurisdictions is gonna be responsible for coming up with its own plan for how to deal with this issue. So what this tells me is that the issue was not just uh, foreseeable, it was foreseen uh, that this was going to be a major problem uh, if you wanted to have a nationwide lockdown of the sort that I experienced was, was, was watching happening in Italy. Uh, this seemed to be probably unconstitutional uh, and uh, would, it, at the very least uh, would go against the way that, that public health had been dealt with uh, in the past. The other issue um, is, is just a political one, um, and that is the uh, President Donald Trump. Uh, it's, um, it's a bit 
of a, well, it's, it's an aspect of how he's decided to deal with the issue. So um, if you read some political science literature, they will say uh, an authoritarian regime will take the opportunity uh, provided by a crisis to consolidate power. Um, so uh, one might expect somebody with uh, uh, authoritarian tendencies, let's say, to uh, take a crisis like uh, COVID-19 and use it to uh, consolidate power. Uh, President Trump took a different approach. Um, he uh, was very happy, it seems to me, to delegate power uh, responsibility for uh, dealing with this uh, uh, pandemic to state and local authorities. And the way this works is that he essentially was, was uh, happy with the status quo. He, this was, um, I remember being uh, involved in a presentation um, and uh, I, I, I made the statement that I thought at the time that you could criticize a lot of things about the way that, that uh, President Trump had dealt with uh, the coronavirus situation. Clearly the cases were going up uh, exponentially uh, but I wasn't quite so sure that he had done anything that was uh, unconstitutional uh, because he was essentially acting as one would have traditionally acted in a public health emergency. Uh, and I remember uh, some comments being made along the lines of, is there some sort of fundamental right that he's violating by not doing more? Uh, and so, uh, the situation became one of which uh, uh, Trump was, was, was quite happy to allow uh, governors and uh, other local authorities to uh, be responsible for this, um, what he expected would be unpopular measures uh, for, you know, involving uh, limitations on people's fundamental rights. Okay, so uh, the next slide, oh, here is just, just a short list here of uh, um, some of the claims that have been made about why uh, certain measures that have been taken uh, have been, um, why they've been challenged as, as not uh, constitutional. Here is a, um, a photo uh, from a, a protest in Texas against the order to wear masks. This is from April. And what's kind of notable here uh, is that they are challenging uh, the decision of a county, so uh, you know a very local level decision uh, about uh, whether or not uh, wearing a mask is against the U.S. Constitution or not. Um, here's another photo from the same from the same uh, uh, protest, where uh, it's not really clear, to be honest with you. Uh, to what extent these protests uh, reflect uh, the willingness or unwillingness of uh, Americans to wear masks. It, it, some, some polls would actually suggest that the Americans are actually quite willing to do it. Uh, and maybe this is a very vocal minority. Uh, but in any case, uh, there's no doubt about it that, that the, the pandemic has, has been politicized. Uh, and, uh, and that uh, there are people who believe that Yes, wearing a mask or a stay-at-home order is 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 a, simply a violation uh, of the Constitution. Um, the so there's where we. Sorry, I apologize. I'm getting a bit tired here. <laughs> so uh, the next thing that happens in this story, uh, from my perspective. Uh, is just about the time that I had said, well, I don't see that, that Trump has, make it, has made any decisions that I would necessarily consider unconstitutional. Uh, helicopters, and I mean this literally, helicopters started to fly above uh, my home. And the reason for that were protests. Uh, so uh, these are actually pictures taken not very far from where I live. Uh, so the death of, uh, of George Floyd uh, in police custody, the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, which flooded uh, the streets of Washington, D.C. and many other cities, uh, brought with them um, a number of uh, challenges uh, to the way that the police dealt with the situation. 
Uh, just another photo for you. And um, in particular, uh, we have two uh, lawsuits, and these are uh, currently, um, I believe, still um, being litigated, uh, both of which, uh, one's in uh, Minneapolis, the other in Washington, DC, um, uh, asserting that, um, that, the, that peaceful protests were being, um, were being dispersed uh, with, uh, with, with uh, uh, exceptional force um, and violating uh, fundamental rights in the process. So, uh, the next shock to the system of the US constitutional system here uh, has come uh, more recently, and that has come with the death of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, who is, uh, a, a, was a, a member of the US Supreme Court. And um, on this issue, uh, I remember actually that Ruth Bader Ginsburg came to Italy, uh, came to my university when I was studying there. And uh, I was pretty excited about it. Uh, this was a, as a really in a, a iconic figure uh, in the United States. Uh, and I remember telling my friends, my European friends mostly, uh, how exciting this was. And uh, the reaction I got from just about everybody was, uh, I don't know who that is, uh, or um, judges are not very interesting people. Uh, one friend of mine, I remember, put it very clearly to me. They, she said, Jeff, uh, we don't do judge worship over here. And, uh, and I thought, well, OK, fair enough. Uh, I understand there's a long tradition of, uh, uh, of, of thinking that uh, judges uh, don't do a whole lot of uh, interesting work. Uh, that the work is rather mechanical. Um, but that's never been the, the view uh, in the United States, um, particularly when it comes to the US Supreme Court. Maybe many reasons for that. Partially, uh, maybe that Supreme Court justices are as a lifetime appointments. Um, and our experience has been that it matters uh, who, uh, who the members of the court are. And uh, I think just to conclude uh, on this point, um, here, here are some pictures very close to my house, actually. Uh, the right one is my, my niece uh, who went uh, to see, uh, to lay, uh, say goodbye to, to Judge Ginsburg and, uh, and lay some flowers at her uh, memorial, uh, which is um, in the beginning, uh, if you looked at uh, a lot of the court cases that were challenging uh, orders for things like social distancing, uh, wearing a mask, stay at home orders, those challenges for, for, were for the most part being um, declared constitutional uh, based on the fact that they were emergency measures. And what I've seen more recently is uh, now we're starting to see cases where a lot of these measures are being uh, struck down by lower courts as unconstitutional, uh, which, by the way, is a power that uh, it, uh, courts in the U.S. lower courts have. They can rule that a uh, that a measure is unconstitutional, uh, even at the lower levels. It doesn't have to be the Supreme Court. And. Um, I think it's inevitable, really, that a lot of the questions that uh, are now starting to uh, come to rise about the question about how long can an, a measure be an emergency measure? Uh, six months, uh, a year, two years, can you have an emergency measure that lasts that long? Uh, and what level of scrutiny uh, is involved uh, or should be involved in looking at uh, the way that lawmakers have uh, constructed uh, certain stay-at-home rules, for example. Uh, those issues are going to be with us uh, for a long time, and I think very, very likely to arrive at the Supreme Court probably multiple times. 
And um, our experience is that it, the answer to those questions and how they're going to be interpreted by the US Constitution will depend on who those justices are. Um, so again, just to, uh, to summarize in the end, I think we're in a period of a lot of flux and uh, the future looks incredibly hazy. Uh, I, I wouldn't dare to, to predict based on how, my experience over the last few months about what's going to happen next. Um, but what's quite clear is that this story is, is, is certainly not one that uh, is at its end. Uh, we're still in the middle of it and perhaps it's accelerating. Thanks very much. Dr. Mira, thank you very much for your um, presentation, especially um, late at night and like you must be really sleepy. But thank you very much for your presentation. And also thank you very much for sharing your um, story because um, that kind of story is really, um, that tells a lot for us and like how COVID-19 has changed society and like how COVID-19 has changed uh, our, lay of, of our way of life. So thank you very much for this. Um, by listening to Dr. Uh, Miller's presentation, I learned that it is um, crucial to identify who has jurisdiction over the U.S. health issues, where each state has a lot of power. Then, well, probably traditionally, the health issue may be something that not all needs to take into account, but the COVID-19 probably is showing that the, the health issues can have a really big impact on our society, then like how to deal with that is a kind of question that um, American people and also the global society need to think uh, to deal with COVID-19. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so after, so we have a uh, um, discussant from the um, politics perspectives. Um, hang on, where the note? Oh, here it is, okay. So um, we have, now we have one discussant um, Professor George Oshani makes uh, comments from the um, perspective of politics. Uh, he's a professor at International Christian University. Um, although he has an urgent meeting from, I think, 4.10, but um, he um, agreed to be, um, to be a panelist here. Thank you very much for that. Um, I, I appreciate his cooperation. Professor Oshani, you have the floor. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me. I'd like to first... Uh... Uh, thank uh, Dr. Akiyama for this uh, wonderful invitation. Uh, it's my first time to be invited back by a former student. Um, and uh, Dr. Akiyama was one of our best students at International Christian University. And congratulations on organizing this event. I've uh, greatly enjoyed all three presentations. Uh, I hope I have something relevant to say. Um, if you uh, don't mind, please. Uh, see my PowerPoint. Uh, I hope you'll be able to see my PowerPoint. Is there any problem looking at it? Okay. Uh, That's good. Okay. Seeing none, um, I would like uh, to um, uh, start by, um, again, thanking the presenters for their very interesting presentations. Uh, I have a series of questions, uh, which general questions, which I'll ask all the presenters. Um, but my main field of interest and study is looking at critical perspectives on human security and uh, COVID-19 can be seen as a uh, human security threat or a threat to human security. Uh, so by way of introduction, particularly for those uh, members of the audience who are following uh, online, uh, there have been 33 million uh, cases of COVID-19 and 1 million deaths. Uh, in fact, I think uh, the 1 million deaths have been announced within the last 24 hours. Um, one of the key themes which have risen throughout the presentations, particularly in the first presentation, um, was uh, the notion of the state of exception. The state of exception can be seen as a legal term, but it has implications for politics. Um, and the state of exception permits a process uh, which we term in international relations securitization. So I'd like to introduce the concept of securitization uh, before turning to my questions. Okay, I hope you can see the picture of, of this man, Carl Schmidt. Uh, Carl Schmidt 
uh, can be seen as one of the most important political and legal theorists of the 20th century. Um, and his uh, influence on politics and international relations, which has been felt uh, increasingly within uh, the past 10 to 15 years, has been in his definition of sovereignty. Uh, for Schmidt, the sovereign uh, is a person or an entity who decides on the exception, on the exception to the rule, on the exception to law. Uh, and Schmidt used this um, to provide a justification, as, as his critics would say, uh, for the Nazi and fascist regimes of the 20th century. So the idea of uh, the sovereign as being uh, he who, and it's usually is a he, uh, in, in the, in the uh, early 20th century, most of the leaders were male, who decides on the exception. It allows the sovereign to declare emergency powers indefinitely. Uh, we see this uh, with fascist Italy, where Benito Mussolini was uh, elected before he, he dissolved the constitutional setup, and most particularly in Nazi Germany, where after the Reichstag fire of 1934, um, the Nazi regime, which were, or the Nazi party, which was part of a um, coalition regime, uh, dissolved uh, the normal parliamentary procedures. However, the Weimar Republic was never abolished. So we can look at um, the Vi uh, we can look at the Weimar uh, the Nazi uh, regime as a continuation of the Weimar Republic under emergency uh, powers. So uh, the main point here is that states of emergency, states of exception, sorry, can be evoked to preserve democracy, usually from internal threats. One of these internal threats can be seen as coronavirus, COVID-19, has led to the declaration of states of exception in many, in many societies throughout the world, giving the state emergency powers. So I particularly like Professor Basilian Ganche's notion of the raison de la santé, uh, instead of raison de l'état, uh, um, to the idea of a health uh, emergency. Um, so reasons for, of health. So this overrides the normal uh, procedures of political power. Um, the uh, popularity in a way of, uh, or the, uh, uh, yeah, the increased importance of, of Schmidt in international relations can perhaps also be uh, linked uh, to the work of Giorgio Gambin, uh, the Italian philosopher, who uh, published a book in 2005 on states of exception, uh, in which he uh, termed the war on terror a global state of exception. So we can look in detail at Guantanamo Bay, Abu Ghraib, as uh, extrajudicial um, innovations, uh, which were normalized as a result of a war on terror. Terrorism is seen as an ex external threat, which allows uh, democratic governments to rave, uh, to waive uh, the rights of, of, of legality or of normal politics. Um, in, uh, so recently, uh, earlier this year, Agamben, who, who is an Italian citizen, uh, argued that COVID-19 had allowed democratic governments to declare emergency powers. And he went so far as to say that the coronavirus, if it didn't exist, it would have been invented. Uh, by democratic power, uh, democratic governments to um, uh, declare emergency powers. Uh, and this leads to a securitization of the people, of the citizens by the state, a suspension of civil liberties, which could perhaps be indefinite. Uh, what do I mean by securitization? Well, within um, the literature and political science, uh, and international relations, particularly critical security studies. Securitization refers to the elevation of an issue to the status of a security threat. It permits the suspension of normal political procedures and the suspensions of civil rights. Examples of securitization include war, terrorism, even smoking, migration, and the environment are issues which have been securitized, which overrule uh, the normal procedures of politics. So COVID-19 
has led to a securitization of everyday life. And this is the important point, even without the declaration of a state of emergency. So uh, governments have been experimenting legally, as we've seen with various uh, emergency powers, uh, which can be invoked um, uh, uh, within uh, the uh, parameters of, of a democratic regime. Uh, and this is something which uh, I have written about and um, uh, hope to develop. So my questions for the participants uh, are as follows. There are three questions. Firstly, does the imposition of a state of emergency put states in a better position to combat uh, COVID-19? So here we're not looking at civil liberties or the impact upon human rights or democracy, but merely how best to tackle COVID-19. Secondly, if so, can, how can we guarantee that states will end the state of emergency after a vaccine is found? Uh, this was a Gambin's uh, uh, worry uh, earlier this, uh, this, um, this year. And finally, what implications does this have uh, for democracy and human rights? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will restrict my comments here in order to give uh, the participants uh, an opportunity to respond uh, to these questions uh, or to any of the questions here, which I have um, uh, uh, pointed out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shani. Um, oh yeah, um, as he mentioned, um, I was, uh, well, I am a former student of him at International Christian University. Then like um, this presentation kind of reminded me of the uh, and, um, and uh, um, with, with him when I was an undergraduate and also a graduate student. And actually his um, comments are interesting to see how um, legal, issues can be related to political or as um, as the, the um, he said securitization but politics or the even the matter which is out of the the issues that are outside of politics and I think um, this is a link which we can make um, between the legal discussion and also the political discussion and also the um, the issues in reality, how we can deal with COVID-19, but by going state of emergency, then like that is, to what extent should we uh, um, empower the government and that kind of um, issues? There are so many questions, um, interesting questions, then you um, pointed out interesting questions. Thank you. And actually, thanks to um, three and also Professor Shani's um, cooperation, actually, um, all presentations were um, strictly, um, all presentations follow the time. What happens with that, we have 15 minutes before the um, the break as we planned. So my idea, which, which I just thought right now is that we may be able to ask three presenters to, if possible, to answer or the, to, to have a reaction to Professor Shani's comment or questions, then if Professor Shani, is it, if possible, please keep this slide here so that everyone can uh, look at this, then like, we can um, comment on the, um, answer the questions or give comment. Is it okay um, for Professor Basilian Genge, Associate Professor Boye hey, or okay. Dr. Jeff Miller? Okay, please, so... Yeah, Professor Basilian Genge, yeah, please uh, respond, respond to uh, Professor Shani's questions. Oh, I think that uh, Professor Shani's questions are very accurate to um, deal with the topic of um, the implications of COVID-19 on human rights and democracy. So the first question about um, the better position state of emergency could give to the states and more precisely the executive power to tackle COVID-19 crisis. Um, I think that using state of emergency, state of health emergency uh, can give the government like a symbolic position, um, uh, symbolic 
way of saying to the population, we are coping with the situation, don't be worried, we are going to be organized to face such a situation. So it's like an auto symbolic uh, reassurance for the government and the population. But um, in a sanitary point of view, uh, in the way the state of emergency was applied in France, uh, it was not a better way to uh, cope with COVID-19 crisis because no sanitary measures were taken to uh, promote uh, the hospitals, to give more uh, equipment to the hospital for reanimation or breathing machines. Uh, there were no solutions about tests, to promote tests between the populations. So, I think that it's only a symbolic and not an effective position that is used by government uh, concerning the state of health emergency. Second point, uh, do we have any guarantee that the state of emergency will end? Well, um, we know that uh, the state of health emergency is ended in France. We are in the way out of the state of emergency. That is the state of health emergency without any name. So it's quite odd. It's an in-between position. Uh, it's not like a trial zone, but a twisted way of thinking of state of, er of emergency. And um, this one will have an end certainly uh, by the end of March 2021, even though we have like an extension again. And I think that it will be um, introduced in the common law uh, at a moment or another. So the state of health emergency or the way out of the state of emergency will be ended, but the measures that uh, such a regime offer the executive to use will be put inside the common law. So um, formally, it's the end, but substantially, it will continue. And what are the implications on democracy and human rights? Well, how I think that, um, for, for instance, there is a debate in France about the mask and uh, wearing the mask uh, in public uh, town is considered by some people as uh, an obstacle to the um, uh, mobility liberties, liberté uh, d'aller venir. I think it's stupid, but um, there is there are another uh, measures that have been taken that are not linked to sanitary emergency, but linked to um, governmental. Uh, priorities of the moment that are very um, that are restricting liberties. At the moment, we know that um, the measures allowed by the way out of the state of emergency have been used to uh, cope with um, militants, uh, defenders of migrant rights, or um, defenders of. Uh, liberty of expressions or defenders of the environment. So we have like a huge uh, danger, a huge risk for a human rights. And I think uh, such use of state of emergency is not a proof of the force of the democracy, or maybe the proof of the force, uh, the power of our government, but the weakness of our government and it creates a decredibilization of democracy and uh, maybe uh, it will be a way for far right movements, nationalist movements uh, to improve their positions on the political scene and I'm very worried about it. Thank you very much. Maybe uh, Associate Professor Boyer, please. Thank you. Thank you um, for the for the, the question that are very uh, interesting and uh, as um, uh, Professor Basilian Gensch uh, says, uh, very accurate. Um, I have the, 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 the feeling that uh, in fact in Switzerland it's a little um, uh, it's not the same as in other countries because um, we have not a, a real a state of uh, emergency or a, a real state of exception. Uh, as I uh, mentioned in my presentation, uh, the, 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 the constitutional uh, system 
uh, wants the, the governments to respect the law and to respect the constitution. So it gives the, the, the power that is uh, given to the, the government is really restrictive and uh, it has to uh, respect uh, the fundamental rights. The, there is just a legality um, exigence that, is, uh, that has not to be respected. So um, we have uh, less risks that the, the measures uh, go too far. But as I explained, um, uh, there is, of course, the problem of the control. And uh, if there is no uh, authority to control uh, the measures, uh, then uh, the system doesn't work. So um, I, I would say that, um, in my opinion, it, it was maybe um, necessary uh, to have uh, the, the, the solutions to take uh, rapid decisions at, at the beginning. So in this sense, uh, the, the state of emergency can be uh, useful uh, just to, to go fast. But um, we have been able to see that uh, after a few weeks, uh, it's possible to go uh, in a normal way and to uh, give the parliament the power to, to, to take decisions uh, and to, um, and to uh, react. So um, when we take the, the both uh, first questions, uh, I would say that uh, it is maybe uh, necessary to have the, this possibility to uh, react uh, rapidly, but we, we, we have definitely to have the, the guarantees that the, the state ends. And that's the big problem, because as I said, in Switzerland, we have a system, this uh, six months um, ratification obligation for the parliament. But in fact, now we are in the procedure of the legalization. So the parliament is now taking control again and uh, will have to, um, to adopt uh, a legislation. But it's um, an extraordinary legislation. And as uh, Professor Basilian Gange uh, underlines, in fact, it will be the same measures that will be uh, taken. So if the, the power is now in the hands of the parliament, the measures will stay, in fact, and will be legalized and uh, will go on, on duration. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's sure that it is, a, it is a, a risk that uh, exists. And in this sense, uh, I, I have the, the opinion that the, the, the third question is the fundamental one. We have to have uh, the, the, the fundamental uh, things in this uh, area, in this crisis, is that uh, the other power, the, the informal power, um, exercise uh, the power. So in, in Switzerland, the press was very restricted. It was not possible to, to, uh, to go to the confer conference room. They had to ask questions in advance and the government didn't re respond to all questions. So that was a first problem. So we have to be sure that the press uh, keeps uh, the power to criticize the government's decisions and to ask questions and to inform. So it, that's the, the first things. And the second thing is that we have to uh, be able to have the lawyers to do their job too. Because during the, the crisis, uh, the, the, the courts were all uh, closed or were working in very uh, slowly uh, procedures. So it was not possible to uh, attack decision to, to, um, to uh, yes, to, to go to the, to the, 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 the judicial courts to, uh, to say that the measures were not uh, proportionate or were not uh, adequate. So um, I would say that uh, for the democracy and the human, human rights, um, it's more the other, other um, protection that has to be uh, maintained. So press, lawyers, and judicial uh, review. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Miller, do you have any thoughts? Thank you. Um, thank you for those, those questions. Uh, they strike me as absolutely appropriate and valid questions for just about every other country I can think of. Um, but if I put, um, if I take this from the American perspective, uh, it's a challenge to answer uh, because uh, 
the facts on the ground here um, have been pretty different. Um, for the most part, um, the criticism of, uh, of, the, of the way that this uh, pandemic uh, crisis has been handled is that uh, the federal government has not done enough, uh, has not uh, used emergency powers enough uh, to uh, combat uh, the pandemic. And this is one of the reasons why uh, the number of cases of coronavirus, um, COVID-19 are as, as high as they are. Uh, so, um, um, so, so the question there doesn't match up very much with, with the reality that, uh, that, that we're experiencing here. Um, in terms of the question about you know how will we guarantee that the that this uh, state of emergency will end, well, in the U.S. I think it's pretty clear, it's quite clear that uh, at least uh, under the current administration uh, they they would like it to end uh, as quickly as possible, uh, and the the motivation for doing so is to get the economy started, uh, and that that is a very strong um, counterforce uh, to having. Um, measures in place that would uh, hinder the, uh, the the economy from from going forward, and uh, in addition to which, uh, you have courts who, um, as I mentioned a bit earlier, are very clearly starting to look at emergency measures and saying um, we're going to start looking much more closely at you know what the laws uh, are that have been passed uh, by. Uh, mostly by state governments. And we are going to really ask the questions uh, at a higher level of standard of review, whether or not these laws are necessary, whether they are proportionate uh, to the threat. Um, this has to do, I think also generally speaking with uh, a much stronger sense of maybe sort of individualism that runs through the US constitution. Um, I don't think uh, it would be possible to maintain emergency um, measures uh, in the United States uh, for very long uh, after, um, particularly if a vaccine is effective and found or we find that we have therapeutic treatments that make this uh, pandemic uh, uh, less threatening on an individual basis. Um, so um, this is just one of those cases where the US is, in the, is, in, is upside down uh, compared to other countries. Uh, the questions that uh, are absolutely valid and uh, for most of the world uh, here, we're just, we just have a different reality as I see it. Dr. Miro, thank you very much. Um, actually, I will present after um, in the part two, but like uh, um, if I can, um, I would like to answer one question, which is third one. What implications does that for, have for democracy and human rights? Actually, that's really interesting to see in the Japanese case. As I will present in the next part, um, the Japan took the um, mild measure. So Japan did not have measure with uh, enforcement mechanism. But recently, um, it, it is on June, but there was an um, um, opinion poll. Then about like 60%, more than 60% of people said the uh, measures with enforcement it is necessary. Then it was really interesting because like um, from the democratic perspective, so f according to people's opinion, they want to have a stronger government. But from the human rights perspective, maybe that restricts the uh, um, freedom of movement or freedom of establishment, which is seems to be problematic from the legal or political perspective. So it's really interesting to see how, what people want and the, what norm, the human rights norm imply then like how do we not necessarily balance but like how, how do we handle these kind of there are many issues including the COVID-19 then we have many norms and like what, what can we do is a really a big question at least from the Japanese perspective so I think the third question is really a difficult one but it's really a question to um, tackle. Thank you very much. Actually, it's um, five past um, four. So Professor Shani will have a meeting five minutes later. So thank you very much. And this concludes, um, it concludes the um, part one of this session. And 10 minutes break from now, then so in Japanese time, um, 15 past four, quarter past four. Then so we have 10 minutes break, then we will um, 
resume. Okay, so we have 10 minutes break. Thank you. This is the beginning of part two. Part two begins with my presentation on COVID-19 and Japan. So I switch my role to the presenter from the moderator now. The title of my presentation is COVID-19 and the Japanese constitution. After the introduction, I will briefly tell you the Japanese situation. Then the Japanese reaction to COVID-19 is covered and the relationship between the Japanese constitution and COVID-19 will be examined before the conclusion. The research question of this session, uh, sorry, of this presentation is that, does the Japanese constitution ban measures with punishment? As I will explain, the Japanese, Japanese reaction to COVID-19 is regarded as a mild reaction without punishment. Although there are states which took strong measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19, Japan does not prepare punishment. Based on this background, I would like to ask this research question. The answer to this research question will reveal whether the Japanese constitution provided a basis for a mild reaction. Let me introduce the Japanese situation briefly. This graph indicates a number of confirmed cases of COVID-19. We need to be careful to read this graph because the number of confirmed cases doesn't indicate the actual number of patients of COVID-19. The first confirmed cases of COVID-19 was reported on um, 16th of January who visited Wuhan, China. From the middle of March, the number of confirmed cases rose. Since the medical service system, such as hospitals, was overwhelmed, the Japanese government declared the state of emergency from 7th of April to 25th of May, either nationwide or parts of Japan. The number of cases declined for a while, but the number rose to 1,595 on 7th of August. Since the government regarded that the medical service system was not overwhelmed compared to the situation at the end of March, and in, May, uh, and in April, the state of emergency was not declared then. It must also be noted that the social economic influence of the state of emergency was strong. Many economic activities were suspended during the state of emergency, and the government seems to take this economic issue seriously. It is important to note that the state of emergency has a strong impact not only from a legal perspective, but also from a socio-economic perspective. The number has declined, to com declined compared to the beginning of August, but the number is around 500 each day recently. As I mentioned, we cannot simply compare the number of confirmed cases since the number of PCR tests changes over time. I can't interpret statistics because I'm not a public health specialist, but I would like to show you data. This slide indicates that the number of PCR tests varies, which means that it is difficult to grasp the Japanese situation's big picture. Let's move on to the Japanese reaction to COVID-19. The Japanese government publishes three pillars of basic strategy. Among them, a relevant idea to this presentation is the third element, a behavior modification of citizens. As we will explore, Japan does not have a measure with enforcement, so to prevent the spreading of COVID-19, a behavior modification of citizens was necessary. Let me introduce a legal framework related to the Japanese reaction. The Act on Special Measures for Pandemic Influenza, hereafter I call the Act on Special Measures, is one important law to deal with COVID-19. Initially, the act, this act was enacted in 2012 to deal with infectious diseases. 
In 2009, the swine flu spread and the pandemic took place. To, to deal with infectious diseases in the future, the act on special measures was enacted. However, initially, this act was not applied to COVID-19. The act's scope was new types of influenza and new diseases, and coronavirus was not included. This act was amended on 13th of March, and COVID-19 became within the, the act's scope. So the government applied, to, applied this act to COVID-19. This act has two phases of reaction. The first phase is the establishment of the response headquarters. When the Minister of Health, Labor and Welfare recognizes a new severe disease, the response headquarters are established. When the situation becomes more severe, a state of emergency is declared. I will explain each phase. In the first phase, when the response headquarters are established, prefectural governors authorized by the national government can request individuals for necessary cooperation. Japan has 47 prefectures and each governor of prefectures is empowered. In the second phase, when the state of emergency is declared, the, the act determines what governors can do more precisely. There are two significant measures. The first measure is a request to refrain from non-essential and non-urgent outings. The second measure is related to the restriction of the use of facilities. Restriction of the use of facilities includes the business suspension. Governors can request facility ma managers to restrict the use of facilities if necessary once the response headquarters are established under Article 24.9. Then, governors can request to restrict the use of facilities again pursuant to Article 45 for those who did not comply with the request in accordance with Article 24.9. When governors request the restriction of the facilities use pursuant to Article 45, not Article 24.9, they will reveal facilities managers' names to whom they request. If facility managers don't comply with the request according to Article 45, governors can instruct the managers to restrict the facilities use. Again, the name of facility managers to whom the governor instructs will be revealed. Although revealing the name, revealing the names can be regarded as a negative inference, there is no punishment such as, such as a fine for non-essential and non-urgent outings or use of facilities against the request and instruction. I will explain how the Act on Special Measures was applied to deal with COVID-19. On 13th of March, the Act on Special Measures began to be applied for COVID-19 and the Act became the basis of the response headquarters. As a result, Article 24 began to be applicable, and governors could request for necessary cooperation. From 7th of April to 25th of May, the state of emergency was declared for either part of Japan or nationwide. During this period, governors and of prefectures in, in which the state of emergency was declared were authorized to apply Article 45, which results in revealing names of facility managers. In reality, governors took two main measures based on the Act on Special Measures. First, governors of all 47 prefectures requested to refrain from outings. Second, measures re uh, related to the business suspension were taken. Governors of 45 prefectures out of 47 requested to cooperate with the restriction of the use of facilities under Article 24.9. Also, 21 prefectures requested an or instructed business suspension and revealed names of facilities. Next, let's examine the relationship between the Japanese constitution and COVID-19. It is very crucial to clarify the background of the Japanese constitution. 
The current Japanese constitution was enacted in 1946 and effective since 1947. After the defeat in World War II, a new constitution was enacted. The 1946 constitution was cautious against the state authority because of the, exp because of the experience of the rise of the military during World War II. Based on this background, clauses on emergency are absent in the current 1946 constitution, although the first Japanese constitution enacted in 1889 contained some clauses on emergency. Protection of human rights is one of the three basic principles of the 1946 constitution. However, there is a concept that can restrict human rights, that is, public welfare. Article 13 of the Japanese constitution is interpreted that human rights can be restricted by public welfare, and this is relevant to the measures against COVID 19. There are three constitutional values that may justify the measures against COVID 19. The first one is the public welfare. Both presidents and academic theories recognize public health as a part of public welfare. Thus, measures against COVID 19 can be justified as a measure to protect public health and public welfare. The second is a welfare right. Article 25 1 of the Constitution provides that all people shall have the right to maintain the minimum standards of wholesome and cultural living. COVID 19 causes health risks so that it can be argued that the welfare right enshrined in Article 25 is at risk. However, both presidents and mainstream academic theories don't recognize substantial rights in Article 25 1. It is understood that welfare right enshrined in the Constitution is guaranteed by statute which implements welfare right. In other words, without specific legislation such as the Infectious Disease Act and the Act on Special Measures, the substantial right cannot be recognized as a welfare right. The third one is the public health. Article 25 2 covers public health and it states that the state shall use its endeavors for the promotion and extension of public health. This article can justify the measures against COVID 19. So, now、um, let's move on to the、uh, human rights recognized by the Constitution, which can be restricted by measures against COVID 19. The first case is business suspension requests and instructions. A relevant concept is freedom of establishment. The Constitution doesn't explicitly provide Freedom of establishment, but it is understood that Article 22, which includes the right to choose occupation, covers the freedom of establishment. There is also an argument that the freedom of establishment should be recognized by combining Article 22 and Article 29, which provides property rights. The crucial point is that both Article 22 and Article 29 are regarded as economic freedom. The Japanese scholars claim that there must be less rigorous standard of, standard of review in case of economic freedom. This understanding is called, called a double standard, referring to the US president, which means that the public welfare needs to be more emphasized in relation to economic freedom. Since measures against COVID 19 can be recognized, recognized to secure public welfare, Restriction to freedom of establishment can be justified. Also, punishment is possible from the constitutional perspective if measures against COVID 19 are recognized as public welfare. The second case is the request to refrain from outings. A relevant concept is freedom of movement. It is argued that the freedom of movement is guaranteed by freedom to choose and change residence in Article 22. Since the freedom to choose and change residence is recognized as an economic freedom, double standard is applied. The public welfare needs to be emphasized 
as in the case of business suspension. However, there is an argument that the freedom of movement can be categorized as a part of personality rights. Such rights can be derived from the right to the pursuit of happiness in Article, two, uh, Article 13. If so, the standard, standard of review to examine the relationship with public welfare may be rigorous, which means that the possibility of the freedom of movement to be respected rises. I would like to explore such possibility, but such a view is not a common today. Such view is not a common one today. As noted earlier, the freedom of movement will be regarded as economic freedom. As a result, punishment is possible from the constitutional perspective if measures against COVID-19 are recognized as public welfare. Let me conclude my presentation. This presentation indicates that the measures against COVID-19 are constitutional. And based on that, the research question for this presentation was that, does the Japanese constitution ban measures with punishment? The answer is that the Japanese constitution allows measures with punishment since actions against COVID-19 can be recognized as a measure to secure public health. In other words, it was not constitution, but politics and legislation that determined the Japanese mild reaction. According to NHK, um, there's one interesting uh, perspective from the um, public opinion. According to NHK, the Japanese Broadcasting Corporation, 62% of respondents responded that the legal amendment is necessary to make measures enforceable at the end of, at the end of June. Close analysis is necessary to examine the relationship between politics which avoided punishment and public opinion which tend to desire enforceable measures. I finish, my, I finish this presentation by sharing issues for the future in my mind. The first one is the relationship between public welfare, emergency, and the constitution. As I noted, the Japanese constitution doesn't have an emergency clause. In Japan, the concept of public welfare seems to justify the measures against COVID-19. However, there's one significant concern. That is expansion of the concept of public, public welfare. There's a question that, is it desirable to justify the restriction of rights using the concept of public welfare, which is used in normal times, even in an emergency, whatever it is. If rights can be restricted under the name of public welfare, restriction of rights can be normalized even if the state of emergency is not declared. Critical analysis on the, of the relationship between public welfare, emergency, and the constitution is necessary, both from practical and theoretical perspectives. The second one is the meaning of the punishment in the constitution. Based on the current understanding, the constitutionality of the measures against COVID-19 doesn't seem to change even if there is a punishment mechanism. However, punishment will negatively influence individuals' rights, so the meaning of punishment in the constitutional theory needs to be explored. The third one, related to the second one, is the meaning of punishment in society. Punishment seems to strengthen compliance with the law, but the careful analysis is necessary to judge the effectiveness of punishment to secure individuals' compliance with the law. These three points can be seen. Um, these points seem to be issues that need to be considered to examine the Japanese constitution's role to deal with COVID-19. Thank you for listening. Okay, um, where, am, where am I? Where am I? Okay, I, I presented you. Okay, now my duty as a presenter has done. So I switch my role to the moderator from the presenter. With my presentation, all presentations are done. So let's move on to the comment um, from the um, two, two discussants. The second discussant after um, Professor Shani is Dr. Joel Glogan. She's a um, senior lecturer in law, 
Middlesex University, London. She makes comments from the perspective of competitive constitutional law. She coordinated an online symposium on COVID-19 and states of emergency on the Vafas Untus blog, which I never pronounce properly. And she has a comparative view on state's reaction to COVID-19 and legal issues. Dr. Grogan, the uh, good morning, everyone from London. Uh, could I first confirm everyone can hear me? Yes. Excellent. And then the second thing is whether or not you can all see my screen. Another yes? Yep. Brilliant. Uh, so again, good morning. Um, could I first say thank you so much to the organizers. This has been an absolutely fascinating panel for me. The presentations have been really fantastic. So what I want to do is to keep my comments as brief as possible to try and pass back to the presenters to get more really fascinating insights onto how countries are responding to the COVID-19 crisis. What I am going to do over the next 10 minutes or so is to give more uh, comparative perspective. So try and take a global look as to how countries have responded, how constitutions have responded to the pandemic. So as we know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, on the 30th of January 2020, the World Health Organization declared that the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 constituted a global health emergency. Over the course of the last eight months, we've seen over 33 million cases confirmed worldwide. And in the last 24 hours alone, over 1 million people have been confirmed to have died from the virus. To give a little bit more information as to my own background, my own research on this, um, as Dr. Akiyama has introduced, I ran the COVID-19 and States of Emergency Symposium. Over the course of about two months, we analyzed how countries and constitutions and legal systems have responded to the pandemic in 74 countries worldwide, representing about 80% of the world's population. To give a little bit of insight on the methodology, we asked all of our contributors, and we had some incredible worldwide in-country contributors, the same questions, the same framework essentially what powers exist, how have they been used. From this, uh, we got some very interesting information as to emergency powers and states of emergency. Of the countries that we analyzed, that was 74 countries, about 41 had declared a state of emergency or had otherwise used emergency powers. This is about 55%. Globally, this tracks just over half of the world's countries have declared a state of emergency or relied on a state of emergency. One thing in this aspect I'd like to very quickly highlight is there's actually a comparative minority of countries who have derogated from international human rights instruments. This is the European Convention on Human Rights in Europe, the America of the ICCP or the International Convention on Civil Political Rights worldwide, and also the American Convention on Human Rights. A minority of countries in the ECHR and the ICCP or derogated from international from these instruments but just over a majority derogated from the American Convention on Human Rights. The reason I wanted to highlight this is that question of whether or not there is a commitment as determined by derogation has not been proven, has not been shown. But this comes back to a very important question which tracked through all four of our presentations, which is should states declare a state of emergency or should they not? Now, through all of the presentations we've heard this morning, we've heard, um, and this afternoon and this evening and this night, we've heard the same tension as to the concerns on the use of power, the concerns on the use of emergency power. In the countries that we analyzed as part of the symposium for the Verfassungsblog, and I also struggled for a long time to pronounce that word, the Verfassungsblog, but we've identified about six reasons or five reasons as to why countries have not declared a state of emergency. 
Now, as Dr. Akiyama was just explaining, the first reason is that there are no constitutional provisions for a state of emergency. That, as has just been explained so, so wonderfully, there were tensions within even introducing a clause for a state of emergency, which meant that there was a reluctance to, to actually even have it exist in the law. However, again, as has just been so wonderfully explained, that hasn't stopped some countries from still having or creating a state of emergency clause in ordinary law. The second reason is that the pandemic did not constitute an emergency within constitutional provisions. Now, for example, this is the country I'm from, the Republic of Ireland. In Ireland, the constitution only allows for an emergency in state of war or armed rebellion. This is entirely based on the history of the country. And for many countries worldwide, a pandemic, especially one on this scale and this scope, is just not imaginable. It didn't happen in history before. The third reason why we've seen a lot of countries, for example, India and Bangladesh, not declare a state of emergency is because of negative historical experience that in prior states of emergency, there's been an abuse or misuse of power. And the current governments do not want an echo of that. They don't want a reminder of that among the population. The fourth reason is, well, in Egypt, there is already a state of emergency, that a state of emergency essentially has not ended in the current situation, it hasn't ended since 2017, despite efforts in the early noughties, in the early 2000s, to try and prevent a situation of perpetual state of emergency. One of the final, one of the final reasons that a state of emergency has not been declared, and this comes a little bit to Dr. Miller's point on the US, is that there's a political context or an unwillingness to declare We've also seen this in the context of Indonesia. Simply, the executive do not want to engage or use emergency powers for a variety of reasons. Alternatively, as we've seen in France uh, with a fantastic presentation by uh, Professor Basignon uh, Gaish, is the creation of a new state of emergency to, again, get away from previous uh, concerns as regards the state of emergency and create a new one with some very deep uh, issues with that with that new state of emergency. What I would say, what I would say is uh, that declaring a state of emergency or relying on ordinary law come both with concerns. And there's actually a lot of concerns with relying solely on ordinary law, just to highlight a few the law, the ordinary law that has been relied on in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic might be very unsuitable because it's very old. To give one example, uh, India has been relying on a law from 1897, which is somewhat unsuited to today's very globalized and digitized world. The other issues with relying solely on ordinary law is especially if it's old, it needs to be amended very, very, very quickly. And a concerning example we saw in Denmark where law was amended within 12 hours. I can actually give an example within the UK context. Uh, we had a law introduced and implemented within minutes and not even before parliament. The concern with this is that the use of powers by government under ordinary laws can sometimes be ultra vires or beyond the power that was intended in the law. This creates huge concerns from a democratic legitimacy and rule of law perspective. What we can say in both the context of ordinary law and the use of ordinary law and also emergency powers is that they're resulting in the same global concerns. And this is what we've seen run through all of the presentations. The first and most critical is a permanent shift in power away from the executive, uh, sorry, away from the legislature, away from parliament towards the executive. We've seen these concerns in Switzerland and in France. We've also seen some conversation about that in the context of Japan. We need to contrast that, however, with what's happening in the US, which is almost the opposite. It's exactly as Dr. Miller described, a, a pushing away, a delegation of responsibility 
away from the federal executive towards regional government. Now, one of the critical concerns with that is one of the observations that we've made is the most successful response to COVID-19 is one that is regional, that is local, but that is coordinated at a national level. Related concerns, again, that we're seeing worldwide and again, that have come through a lot of the presentations include the limitation of parliamentary oversights, the limitation of courts, all connected with a deeper concern for disproportionate and unjustified restrictions on individual rights and liberties. This is all coming to that critical and absolutely correct phrase that we heard in the very first presentation by Professor Bézignon Gash, which is the normalization of the exceptional, the, normali the normalization of emergencies. What constitutions try to do in the context of emergency power is not allow that normalization. They do that through conditionality, conditionality on the use of power. What we have seen in constitutions, and this is going to be a critical question as we go forward and look at reform of law, whether or not reform is needed, is to ask a very simple question of, is the introduction of more conditions, more conditions on the use? For example, you can only declare a state of emergency if the World Health Organization has declared a global state of health emergency. Is the introduction of more conditions, does that create a safer environment for democracy and a safer environment for the rule of law? Or, and this is the reason uh, in the 1940s why there was no introduction of an emergency clause within the Japanese constitution, is the mere existence of the power of exception, that power of emergency, does that create such a problem, such a possibility for misuse and abuse that it shouldn't exist in the first place? The questions of conditions, the questions of safeguards are going to be critical going forward. Just to briefly say in the context of my own research that there are some conclusions that we can draw from the current context. First, Declaring a state of emergency or relying on ordinary legislation made the likelihood of abuse or misuse of law no more and no less likely. Essentially, a state which has declared a state of emergency is no more and no less likely to commit abuse than one that hasn't. Second, the effectiveness of legal safeguards against abuse depends on executive observance of the rules and also the strength of the separation of powers to enforce it. What this means is that we need to look at the larger political context to ensure the necessary safeguards against misuse of power, against abuse of rights is important. We need to look at that larger political context. Third, and finally, while it is too early to identify the best practice there is emergent evidence of very good practice, good practice which leads to lower mortality rates and earlier lifting of restriction. This is state policy and state law which is based on legal certainty, on transparency, on the clear communication of rules and regulations, and also early reaction, early coordinated and re very responsive action. As a final point, I have three questions for the presenters. First, do you consider that existing constitutional and legal safeguards are sufficient? Second, how does the larger political context play into the sufficiency of these legal safeguards? And third, and this is the one that I'm very curious about from all our presenters this morning, or this afternoon, this evening, and this night, what constitutional or legal reforms would you like to see following the COVID-19 pandemic? On that note, I'd like to say again, thank you to our fantastic organizers. Uh, thank you also to the translators. I look forward to hearing from the presenters and uh, Domo Arigato.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Glogan. Actually, um, thank you very much for um, showing the um, showing your appreciation in Japanese as well. <laughs> it's really, um, uh, it's really happy. Uh, yeah, Dr. Glogan's um, comparative analysis is really interesting. Then, especially um, she compares so many um, countries, not th th these four countries, but also many countries. So she came up with many interesting um, observations. And uh, yeah, so um, especially your questions were really interesting. They're like I myself is really interested in the, the in, interested in that, and I'd like to um, hear your um, panelists' uh, opinion about the um, question. Thank you very much. And the final discussion is Professor Yukiko Wagatsuma. She's a professor at the University of Tsukuba. She, she will make a comment from the um, public health perspective, which is a critical aspect to look at the reaction to COVID-19. Professor Wagat, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Yeah. And share my screen. So I'll share my screen first. Yeah. I hope you can see. Yep. Right. Okay, thank you very much at first for the organizers, especially the Dr. Akiyama to invite me as a discussant. Uh, for the public health aspect. I don't want to unnecessarily repeat that all the epidemiological fact of the COVID-19 pandemic station. Rather, I am seems that only the public health expert here. So I want to focus on the, some uh, questions and discussion point to uh, raise among the uh, panelists. Let me show at first the basic policies just uh, issued at the May 25th by the government of Japan for the uh, novel coronavirus disease control. They rely on the three issues. This is very common uh, disciplines for the infectious disease control people in the world. So the older epidemiologist or infectious disease controlist in different countries, maybe every day in the somewhere the broadcasting and narrating in the station of infectious stations, medical service systems, and surveillance system. But the, I want to rather raise the issues of heavily de defending about the only the profile of the infection and medical systems and surveillance systems is sometimes uh, we might have to look at from the broader perspective. So I really appreciate for your uh, specialities to look at these uh, issues. I just read it as a kind of the definition issues. Infection station, whether or not there is no sign of an um, explosive spread of the infection and whether or not the number of newly reported cases at the level where the counter cluster measures can be taken sufficiently. The medical service system is whether or not a medical service system has been established to respond sufficiently even if the infected patient particularly those with severe symptoms increase. The surveillance system is whether or not a system has been set up to detect early trends of infection spreading and to respond immediately. Likewise, when it is confirmed that it is no longer necessary to take emergency measures, a comprehensive judgment shall be made based on the above criteria. So this kind of statement are uh, instrumental for many uh, governors or the governments to issue the certain reactions 
measures of even the timing to impose the certain measures. Since this is my uh, discussions at the end, so I may repeat it that some of the uh, common questions that previous uh, panelists already raised. But uh, we learned from the presenter the various emergency responses to the COVID-19 has been taken by different countries. Amazingly, different responses was also imposed at the different point of pandemic station. The concerns were raised from many states on the use of existing and or the new legal tools. So my question to the panelists are, how can we ensure the light under the state of emergency or the nearly the state of emergency due to unprecedented infectious disease pandemic like this time? How can we assure the light when the legislative measures are taken to isolate socially for healthy suspected contacts when the disease surveillance reveals? You may see in the, some of the media videos, some Asian countries due to the previous experience of the source of MERS, they have very restrictive tracing system under surveillance. And sometimes it's almost might be violating the human right. So these questions are raised from me. So my presentation is very short ladder, but I want to remain more time on discussions. Thank you. I return to you, Dr. Kiyama. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wakatsuma. And actually, your final questions are really tough, actually. And uh, I think it's, it's really important for us, the um, legal scholars, and also the uh, health, um, public health scholars to kind of share our knowledge, because otherwise we can't really um, deal with um, infectious diseases such as um, COVID-19. So, but um, your insight, especially from the um, based on the Jap Japan's basic um, policies, is really important. That important thing that we need to uh, take into account. Thank you very much for your comment. Okay, let's move on to the um, panel discussion. In this panel discussion, presenters will present um, respond to the questions and comments given by discussants. And uh, there are some questions um, by um, participants. So we will, I hope we can um, elaborate with on the, these questions which were raised by participants. I will ask um, presenters to speak uh, maybe 10 minutes maximum, or but, but maybe a bit less than 10 minutes would be good so that we can um, um, share our views uh, um, with the uh, um, discussions at the end as well. So, um, Professor Basilian Gensh, please. Uh, yes, um, I think that uh, the two comments and questions that were raised just before are particularly uh, accurate at the moment. And uh, I will try to give some answers. I have not all the answers to all the questions, but maybe some elements of, con uh, of answers are um, pathways to answers. Uh, first of all, one point that both commanders um, raises uh, is the limitation of uh, the executive powers uh, in uh, fighting the COVID-19 crisis. So the control of the restrictions on rights and liberties. I think we have two uh, powers that are supposed to ensure such control on the restriction on rights. That is the parliament and the judicial authority. Uh, in fact, in France, um, the several months uh, that passed uh, since the emergency of 
the crisis uh, showed that the parliament uh, is not willing to uh, address any control on executive measures. And I think that the composition of the parliament uh, with uh, the presence of a huge majority of the deputies that are part of the party of the President Emmanuel Macron uh, is obviously uh, the reason why there is no opposition in the parliament against the um, executive measures. Nevertheless, we saw the same uh, relentless uh, to execute any control, any in-depth control during the state uh, of emergency uh, following the um, Paris uh, terrorist attacks, because we uh, registered several prolonged extension of the state of emergency without any in-depth debates in the parliament. What about the judiciary? Uh, in fact, um, concerning the Council of State and the Administrative Church, uh, the different decisions that have been handled down since the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis show that the um, Administrative Church is always um, adopting the position of the government, uh, is not exercises um, a real control, uh, a, a an in-depth scrutiny of the measures adopted by the executive, but in the other way around, uh, the administrative judge is satisfied by the vague commitments, uh, some references to some discourse without any proof that is it is implemented in real, and it gives great value of what the government should do, but did not do. So we do not have any control of the rights of limitations that are present at the moment in France. So it is why I am, and with other scholars, particularly concerned about the situation. Another point was uh, underscored concerning the difference between the state of emergency of 19. 55 and the state of health emergency of 2020. In fact, um, we can see that the first one is was adopted uh, in the middle of the Algerian independence war and the goal is essentially security and security, political security. And uh, the idea was not to use the state of siege because it would have um, been uh, the legitimization of the uh, independentist in Algeria. So it decided to create something new in order to not say the Algerian independentist were enemies according to um, international conflict law. But um, this state of emergency of 1955 only uh, let the government, the executive, power to uh, adopt, handle and apply individual measures. Concerning the state of health emergency that was adopted in 2020 and applied uh, the same day, uh, we have sanitary aims that are clearly um, underscored, but these sanitary, sanitary aims, health public security aims, are uh, designed to be uh, cope with security measures in a very strange way, or how security measures can improve sanitary situation. Uh, we have no clue, and we have no clue of the efficiency of the measures that have been adopted and applied. And what is important is the state of health emergency let the government adopt not only individual measures, but also general measures as the um, uh, total uh, lockdown that we saw, with also criminalization of the not um, applying the different isolation, quarantine or protection measures. So I am very concerned about this um, powerful um, tool that the executive is using at the moment and I think will use again and by the um, auto limitation 
in the control the parliament and the judiciary is showing at the moment. That will be my all comments. I think I am in, in the time allocated. Thank you, Alligator. Thank you, Professor Vatilingesh. Yeah, well, actually, you are sh shorter than the time allocated, so don't worry about that. But like, thank you very much. Okay, um, Associate Professor Boye, please. Thanks a lot for, for all the, the questions and the very good presentation. It was very interesting to, to follow uh, the, the present, uh, presentation for Dr. Rogan because uh, the, the old countries that she studies was really, uh, really very interesting. And I, I must say that I, I read a, a lot of uh, very interesting articles on the Verfassung's blog <laughs> uh, that, uh, that were published. Um, to, to, I'll try to respond to the, to the, the questions too. Um, and for the, first, uh, for the first question, if I think that, um, that the existing constitutional uh, legal framework uh, is, uh, is uh, sufficient, um, I will, I will in, fa in fact refer to my, uh, to my presentation and uh, repeat what I, uh, I conclude. It's that the, in Switzerland, we have a few tools that were thought uh, after the, 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 the pandemic of uh, 2003. And I think uh, we have a few tools that uh, can work, but uh, they are uh, a few, um, they are limited and they are not perfect because uh, the, the role of the parliament is really not, not clear and uh, not enough. So we, we should increase the role of parliament uh, uh, in a few ways. Uh, uh, first, uh, I, I would think that when the, the emergency state is declared uh, by the government, uh, I would find it prefer preferable that the parliament is consulted uh, in a way that is maybe not necessarily um, obligatory. So maybe just a, a, an informal uh, consultation could be enough, but uh, I would say that the parliament should be uh, consultated. And um, the other um, the other thing that was not very well uh, uh, in this crisis was the, the role of the judicial control, as I said, because there is really not uh, a lot of possibilities to uh, to um, <clears throat> control the, the decisions of, of the of the government because uh, we have to wait uh, for a decision. So a decision that is concrete and that concern uh, individuals. And in fact, a lot of decision was very general and uh, were collective ones, uh, which means that it was not maybe uh, possible to um, attack them. So for example, when the, the government decide that people cannot uh, gather or that uh, the, the schools are, are closed, it's not, it's not a personal decision, it's a general decision. Uh, that means that it's difficult to um, attack such a such decision. So in this, in this way, I would say that the, the constitutional framework exists, uh, has worked in fact, because uh, Switzerland was able to, to stop the, the spread of the virus. virus. So it was, uh, it was uh, in this sense, it was, uh, a good reaction and uh, the framework uh, seems to, to work, but it was, um, it was uh, criticable because the tools were not uh, sufficient. And in fact, in Switzerland, the decisions were not so strong as in France. So it was not a, a veritable lockdown. We were able to, to go out and uh, a few, uh, shops were able to, to, to work, but <clears throat> if the, the, the decisions would have been um, stronger, uh, I'm not sure that the tools that are in uh, place in Switzerland would have been uh, sufficient to um, respond and to, um, to critique the, the decision of the, criticize the, the decision of the government. Uh, so, if I respond to the third question too, uh, I would say that um, the constitutional framework and the legal framework in Switzerland needs to, to be uh, reformed. Uh, there is a lot of um, things that can be improved in the future 
to be sure that uh, the tools are uh, at the disposal of the citizens to be able to uh, attack decision and to control the constitutionality of, uh, of this decision. So I would say that uh, the ju judicial control must absolutely be improved, that's the first point, and the role of parliament too. Uh, so that the, the separ so separation of powers uh, is uh, better respected even in time of crisis. And uh, concerning the political context, I must say that it is also something that is very different in comparison, in comparison with France, because in Switzerland, um, we have a, a political system that is very uh, um, special. It's a sui generis uh, system uh, that is not uh, very similar with other system, uh, with uh, this government that is made of, uh, at the time, uh, four parties, so uh, support polit polit political parties, that means that uh, it's not one uh, majority that uh, is at the, the executive, it's really a mix of uh, political parties that must represent uh, more uh, or less uh, the, the political parties that are in uh, the uh, parliament. So that helps to, um, to um, take decisions that are well accepted because it's, uh, it's uh, different political parties that uh, decide, it's not the, the, a majority. And um, these political parties uh, are, have, have uh, back the, the parliament because uh, a, a, a member of the government uh, who is from the left side have all the, the parliaments that are from, from the left side that are behind him and it's the same thing for the all members of the government. So that helps to take uh, proportionate measures and measures that are well uh, accepted because there is always this uh, consensus that has to be uh, uh, found uh, in Switzerland. So in this sense, the, the, the balance between uh, the, the, pa the parties, between the powers uh, is better uh, than in other uh, countries. Um, what can I um, add? I think uh, that's maybe the, the, thing, the, the, the two things that I wanted to uh, add and maybe just to, um, to be sure that uh, uh, to, 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 to respond to uh, maybe the, the last uh, question from uh, um, Professor Wagata uh, Tso. Um, I, I would say that uh, maybe uh, in, in the, the European uh, countries, uh, uh, there is um, maybe with the, for the risk uh, of limited uh, the, the human rights, uh, we have uh, uh, our, our courts, so uh, judicial court that are uh, present, but we all are submitted to the European Court of Human Rights. And I would say that um, uh, the measures uh, like um, profile, uh, uh, um, ah, to 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 follow the people and to um, and to to try to uh, to um, identify the people that are sick and that has to be isolated. Uh, that's measure that are very criticized uh, in this sense uh, that are they are very um, uh, they are violating the private intimacy. And in the in, the, in this sense, I have the feeling that people. Uh, and the European Court of Human Rights um, is watching uh, about the thing, but in fact, that's the problem of the of the of the duration of the measures and the duration of the procedure because uh, the the legislation can be adopted now. The people can be um, can be uh, followed and uh, trust, and in fact, the procedure are very slow. So even if the 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 violation of uh, human rights is uh, admitted, it, it will be too late. So that's my, my comment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Associate Professor Boyer. Um, Dr. Mila, please, are you still awake or? Thanks, I'm, I'm mostly awake. We, we, we've reached 4.30 in the morning here, so I hope you'll take some pity on me if this is not entirely coherent. But um, I guess um, 
part of uh, what I've been experiencing here over the last few hours uh, is uh, a recognition or a reminder of, um, well, just how, uh, how much of a, how at least how different uh, the situation in the United States is compared to most of the countries in Europe, um, which now that I've been in the United States uh, for the last seven months, um, I've started to forget. Um, I've, I've started to reacclimate myself to, to, to life in the United States. Uh, and um, the first question uh, that uh, Professor Gorgon has here, um, do you consider the existing constitutional and legal safeguards to be sufficient? Um, I, I just had to kind of smile because uh, um, Recently, I came across a, uh, I'm teaching a course on uh, a basic course on US law and uh, the textbook said uh, the US Constitution is the greatest legal document ever created. Um, not as an opinion, but as a fact, uh, as if one should, if it was on an exam, you should write down that the US Constitution is the greatest legal document ever. Um, so it, it gives you a sense of uh, the high esteem that uh, the U.S. Constitution has uh, in the American um, imagination. Uh, so I haven't seen very much discussion uh, that has uh, said that uh, that the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, is somehow lacking um, or it's unworkable. Um, that has not been part of the debate. Um, and I guess even I have not really seriously considered that. Perhaps I'm already becoming a victim of my environment, um, but um, uh, that's just not in the cards. Uh, of course, the document's also very old and um, I don't imagine uh, that the founding fathers of the US constitution ever had anything like a pandemic in mind. Uh, of the nature of COVID-19. Um, public health emergencies were, for the most part, things that should be dealt with locally. They were local outbreaks. And this strikes me as, uh, as unsurprising that uh, the division of powers between the federal uh, government and the state government would delegate most of that power to the state governments. Um, and again, as, as uh, Dr. Gorgon points, or Professor Gorgon pointed out, uh, maybe that's okay if there is good coordination uh, between the different jurisdictions. Uh, that has definitely not been the case in the United States. Um, and there would be no mechanism um, other than a voluntary one, which to some degree has happened. Um, between different jurisdictions, local jurisdictions, state jurisdictions to, uh, because of course we have people traveling between different states. And uh, even if there are some requirements in place that people need to quarantine for a certain number of days, uh, very difficult to, um, to enforce those rules. And so uh, I suppose uh, in that respect, you have to say the US constitution has a, has a really big problem when faced with uh, COVID-19. Uh, the political context, I think I've, uh, I've probably addressed uh, already. Um, I don't know how this, uh, this would play out under a different president. Uh, it's, it, maybe we'll find out. Uh, we, have no, we have elections in November and uh, maybe we'll see. Um, and then the last question about constitutional or legal reforms that you would like to see. I suppose, I'm not sure if I can answer that question, it's too difficult, um, but maybe I just have a couple of observations to share. Um, I think that one of the things that makes the pandemic um, challenging uh, for us uh, legally and politically is um, something that I saw um, a medical expert talking about on TV one day. And they said it, he, he couldn't think of a period in time when what you do affects me so much. Uh, 
we like to believe that, uh, you know, as individuals, we can go about in our daily lives and most of the things that we do with ex kind of extreme exceptions, mostly don't affect other people. But the decision that somebody makes, if they are going to go to a party with 50 other people, uh, may in fact have an effect on my health one day. I may get COVID because of that. Uh, rates of COVID may, may, may rise as a result of what other people are doing. Uh, and uh, this also would apply, for example, to freedom of assembly, which we don't normally think of as a, something that could be possibly threatening to the rest of society um, if people want to have a peaceful protest or something like that. Don't normally think of that as as being something that's likely to be life threatening to the rest of us who are not uh, involved in the protest, or even not life threatening for those in the protest. And I think all those things sort of point to certain challenges that we have that we don't have much. We can't really look back on on too many examples from history to help us out. Um, there are essentially no examples in US law about what the law should be about social distancing, for example, or you know, what is an essential business that should, what, why should one business stay open while another one is required to close? Questions like that are really almost, we have to figure out from scratch. Uh, and um, I think, uh, I think, we will muddle through, we will find ways to say what it means uh, during an extended pandemic to, uh, to deal with issues like that, where we are making conscious decisions to curb certain rights because we think it's worthwhile to do so, even over a very extended period of time. But for me, uh, I just see so many new issues arising uh, that nobody uh, has the answers to yet. Um, and we probably will not know for some time. Um, I, so again, that doesn't really answer your questions, uh, but I'm doing my best to at least sort of point to um, the direction in which I, I suspect, uh, you know, the legal discourse is likely to, to go into the future. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. Your, your kind of answer, comments was really, um, well, like I, I, I kind of can share how you feel because I also that it's really difficult to answer that kind of question because, well, yeah, no one has an answer, but like, I, I think it would be a really interesting to share uh, what I think and what we think. And uh, as a presenter for the um, Japanese perspective, uh, let me answer uh, your questions, including the um, participants question. Um, yeah, so regarding the uh, Dr. Grogan's um, question, legally, the current Japanese law legally sufficient? Mm, um, I'm not too sure about this, but I, th mm, I think it's really important for us to have an expert's um, perspective, but in, in particular, the public health perspective, because I, I think we can't really judge with the current um, situation, uh, sorry, current measures are uh, enough or not. If the um, restriction of rights is not necessary, I, I don't think it's good to have a restriction. So restriction, rest, um, rights restricted, only one that's necessary, but like who decides that necessity. I think that um, it's, it's not something uh, who decides, but who kind of advise. Then the uh, scientists should have a play, uh, should play law. Of course, scientists may uh, maybe politicize, but I think the at least trust to the uh, science or the scientists is really necessary. So from my perspective, I don't really know whether the current law is sent or not, but the um, public health specialist view is really necessary, I think. But regarding the second question, the political, I think that that's really interesting. That was really interesting. That last night, I mean, the in the Japanese time last night, I had an email 
um, communication with Pro Professor Shani, then it was really interesting because um, from the political point of view, um, Prime, uh, former Prime Minister Abe was really eager to amend constitution. And he, his idea was to um, have a emergency clause in the new constitution. So from that perspective, I think it would be a good idea, uh, for him at least, it, would, it could be a good idea to kind of indicate that, that, oh, state of emergency, sorry. Then in order to do so, probably the stronger measure could be taken, or, or which means that the um, stronger legislation, because the constitution doesn't uh, prohibit the stronger measures, but there's no such legislation. So um, probably, um, stronger measures cannot be taken but if the law is amended i think the um which is constitutional law is amended the um stronger measures can be taken but interestingly uh, even when prime minister abe declared the um state of emergency I, i'm not too sure because like i am not a public health specialist but at least from the public opinions or the um general public's um, perspectives i would say there were people, there were a certain number of people that wanted or even kind of um, said it is necessary to um, for the um, state of emergency to be declared. And uh, actually, it took time. It took time to until actually the, the declaration of state of emergency. Then I think what it implies, it is not, um, I, I can't really find the exact um kind of proof but what it implies is that the Japanese politics kind of tendency towards the kind of um, Japanese politics doesn't want to really um, strengthen the government I think that has a historical reason which is really understandable because when we talk about the um, reform constitutional reform for example that's really big issue that's really big issue and um, I would say the um, debate of the um, amendment of the constitution it's really different compared to other states I think because in Japan the experience of World War II is really strong so I think it's really um, politically sensitive to think about the um, pro, um, constitution reform but at the same time I think it's really interesting to compare the issues of COVID-19 with the uh, well let's say war with other states or the um, emergency as uh, we have traditionally understood. Because we hear the word emergency, uh, we, we, what we have in mind was used to be, say, war or political or economic kind of social um, battle with other states. But regarding the um, COVID-19, of course, there are elements of the um, political debate or the political um, crush, of course. But fundamentally, the COVID-19 itself is an infectious disease, which means that the enemy for, well, let's say, let's say Japanese government or Japanese people is not necessarily other people, but the infectious disease itself, which is outside of the scope of social sciences. It's, it's nearly the area of natural science. Then if so, I think we may need to think differently because the nature of the issue of COVID-19 may be different from that of the um, war against other states. Then if so, I think it may be interesting to think about the role of the constitution while um, the state can respond to um, national issues, uh, so, sorry, natural um, disasters or the um, infectious diseases issues. I think that should be regarded as a bit different issue from the um, social issues such as wars and which are political or economic ones. And regarding the, um, yeah, um, Professor Wagatsuma's question, uh, what can we do? Actually, that's really big. But I think what, what is really important is a communication. There are two important things. One thing is a communication with expert or maybe trust for the expert. Um, of course, I, I'm not a, I, I, I was not a, kind of decision maker for this issue in Japan. So I, I can't say uh, what was happening in reality, but from the outside of that decision-making body, what I can see is kind of 
miscommunication or yeah i would say miscommunication between politics and the scientists then maybe scientists knowledge should be uh, regarded as regarded to be more uh, more important one because of course it, uh, and the political decisions that are really important of course but at the same time um, infectious diseases disease is not something social science can deal with i think natural science perspective is really important then i think that kind of respect for the um, that knowledge of science is really important and also the second one is the uh, democracy or the people's um, understanding or the pe- people's opinion i think that is important as well um, this is not only about the covid but also i think all over the world um, people's kind of um, democracy or the division of the society i think they are really important issues because um people's voice are not really hard i think there are um, some certain number of people who feel that my voice is not real then as a result the um strong division of the in society um we can observe these kind of strong in society and i think that kind of tendency can be seen um all over the world and covid-19 took place then what happens is that there are people who said that stronger measures need to be taken but there are some other people that who said that civil liberties are more important i think both um opinions are really important so i said but communication with expert is really important but at the same time how people think is really important i think because i i'm a social scientist so from my perspective the scholars tend to say that this is the right thing or the tend to say tend to kind of reach an answer but in the social sciences i think it's really important for us to be aware of the kind of necessity to um look at people how people feel the like what is the reaction the, what is the social reaction and what should be done so science is necessary but at the same time people's opinion is necessary then when we kind of not necessarily compare but like when we look at this scientific knowledge and the um people's view then what is the answer it's really important but such a we didn't have such um exercise so far so i think we should have um these two perspectives experts perspective and also the people's democratic perspectives and third one okay so um one participant asked a question then read me um question based on the capacity of japanese constitution were japan and japanese local governments actually able to pull out lockdown policies such as foreign cities of uh, foreign cities or will heavy lockdown be a constitution um it's well to be honest it's not easy to answer because i know that um they, they can the some participants uh, maybe constitutional legal scholars then like i'm not too sure whether um they with me but my understanding my understanding is that the japanese government could could take stronger measures including lockdown probably not now because um there's no uh, sorry there's no law to implement that but for example if the the act on special measures was amended i think it was possible so from from the constitutional legal perspective i don't i don't see much issue of course the procedure there must be the right procedure then like uh in the procedure there are some provisions in the constitution of course that can be an issue but i would say um regarding the strong such as lockdown i think the, the japanese constitution doesn't prohibit that but then the issue is the political um willingness or the political stance whether the government um takes that kind of decision well like before that i think it's really necessary to see that whether it is necessary to take that necessary uh so sorry um in, uh, that strong measures is it necessary to do so i think that's a really important question to be asked but even if necessary the next question would be is the politic um politician political entities are they um ready to do that kind of strong measures then i think that kind of political perspective is really important especially in the japanese case to think about the um the method um, the, the way to deal with covid-19 at least so far 
Okay, thank you very much. I um, there are, maybe I can ask uh, Dr. Glogan and Professor Wagatsuma for their comments. Maybe three minutes or so, or three minutes or four minutes uh, for the for for their thoughts. Um, maybe you can you can um, you are listening to um, our discussion. Then you can kind of share your thoughts from your perspective, especially the um, comparative legal perspective and those or the uh, public health perspective. Dr. Glogan, do you have any thoughts? Uh, absolutely. Again, this just confirms how important it is to have these international conversations. I think just reflecting on uh, so much of what has just been said uh, by, by all four presenters, just in terms of how we need to think about the law, how we need to think about how the law applies, also how we need to think about the larger social and political environment that informs and tells us almost how law is applied and how law is realized in a day-to-day -day basis, how this is so important. I think uh, one, of my, one of my final reflections actually comes back to two things that came out so much of, of my research. And um, eventually with, with a colleague of mine in the Bingham Center, we created the policy advice. We created principles that all countries should uh, act upon. But one of the two or two of the principles that came out um, in this policy work and that has come out so strongly in the commentaries and in fact the whole panel that we heard today was first the importance of expert opinion and the importance of experts um, contribution to debates so having public health expertise having legal expertise having political expertise giving opinion and analysis of what is happening in real terms so much of our concern relates to um, the consolidation of power. So executive governments taking power and keeping it, but so much of that uh, can be responded to by again, having very open and critical discussions and debates about what's going on. The second uh, reflection almost of the whole day, and this is again, a thank you to the organizers is to have as we've just had international and comparative perspectives. Now, I, I recognize that I'm in an incredibly privileged position that I got to devote so much of my, my life to looking at comparative responses to COVID-19 over the last uh, nine months. But one of the most important things we always need to do is to look at what everyone else is doing. How has France and the French legal system responded? How has Switzerland and the Swiss legal system responded? How has the American legal system and the American political system not responded? And also how is Japan responding? By looking at international perspectives, by looking with an international perspective, we can see what works and we can see what doesn't work. Um, I think this, these, for me, are the two most important things to bring out today. First, the importance of discussion and expert discussion, informed discussion, and also looking with an international perspective for the very best practices for how best we can cooperate and respond globally and nationally to the COVID-19 pandemic. So again, Tomara Kato. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gogan. Um, do you have any thoughts, Professor Wakatsuma? Yes. Yes, I have a few words. I, I don't need to repeat again about the importance of this kind of communications, even the public, I'm sure, uh, they learn a lot each other. So we've seen that lots of different information from different countries and then the, the different government reacted different way. And then that we actually adjusted our own behaviors. I think that is really encouraging, especially the public health frontliners in the municipality level so of Japan, they are really hard worked. And then they sometimes there's issues 
is this really correct to continue? And it was very hard because the, the imposing the measure is fine, but implementation in the front line and then the restricting the people's right in the front line is a hard decision. So uh, that sometimes we work on the national guideline or national manual, but those who are making the decisions in the national level needs to consider those who are at the more wider context of the social and the vulnerable people at the ground. Even this pandemic stations, people might suffer more in the resource poor countries. So we have to think about that such a contributions can be Thank you very much. Um, Professor Wakatsuma's um, comment uh, reminded me that there must be a kind of international perspectives. For example, um, which states have resources? Then like which states don't have resources? Then like what can be done to from which country to which country? So I think it was a uh, really important um, perspective. Thank you very much. Um, it's nearly the end of this. Um, um, thank you very much for your participation in the panel discussion. It's nearly the end of this session. Let me close this session. As all of us witness, um, there are many possible constitutional and legal issues to deal with uh, um, COVID-19. I learned the necessity to have many perspectives as uh, um, Dr. Grogan said. Um, a comparative legal perspective is very, and also not only legal perspective, also the political perspectives, uh, the um, public health perspectives are necessary. So we need to have many perspectives. And, and uh, actually I uh, found, uh, um, I, um, I received an interesting question from the participants right now, which asked the question, um, which said that um, the limitation of the judiciary, because it takes, um, there was a discussion on the judicial review, but basically it takes time to, um, to, to, to go to the process of judicial review. But in the case of, let's say, COVID-19, we can't, we don't have enough time to um, do that, right? So we need to respond quickly. But if we need to um, follow the procedure, which is really important value for the law, the legal studies, we may, miss, uh, we may miss something really important. So I think that's uh, really a big um, challenge for the law or legal scholars to think, what is the role of the constitution? Um, pr probably the securing the process is really necessary, but in emergency, what can be done? But at the same time, as uh, Professor Basri and Gaines um, presentation and Professor Chinese comment indicated, there can be um, politics that, that kind of make use of emergency power. Then how do we, how do we examine that and also the necessity to deal with the COVID-19 or infectious diseases rapidly? I think that's really a important question, but at the same time, tough question. I hope um, I learned a lot and I hope you found clues to deal with um, COVID-19 through presentations and uh, comments of this session. The important thing is that we are not sure when the issue of COVID-19 ends. Um, it may take quite a while to, um, until the end of the battle against COVID-19. If so, we will need to um, continue thinking about covid from various perspectives, including constitutional ones. Actually, this was uh, um, the first session for me to organize, uh, not, not necessarily the online session, but like it was the session which I organized first, but at the same time, it was the first session that I, online session that I organized, as you can see from the technological um, issues. Um, well, um, I really wanted to make this possible because um, I thought it was necessary for us to have national conversation and also interdisciplinary conversation to think about COVID-19, which is a really big um, global issue. Well, this session was not possible without the support of all of you. Thank you very much for all panelists who um, agreed to participate in this session. Thank you very much for um, your participation. Thank you. Um, it's very, despite your busy schedule. A special thanks are ended to um, Associate Professor Boye. Um, she assisted me um, since I was planning this session. Actually, there was no one there. Then like I was just contacted um, Professor Boye about, the, oh, I want to do this. Then like, uh, then she said that, oh, okay. Um, she introduced the 
Fafas Unis blog to me. Actually, I had a chance to communicate with um, Dr. Grogan. So thank you very much for your um, assistance. Also, the staff for this session, Ms. Uh, Chisato Oyama, an undergraduate student at University of Tsukuba, worked really hard to make this session possible. Uh, and as you can see, when I had a, an issue, she assisted me uh, really properly. Thank you very much. And simultaneous interpreters made this session possible to be bilingual because this is an international issue, including the Japanese issue. I really wanted to make this um, session to be bilingual. So um, of course there was a um, technological issue which I need to uh, um, uh, apologize, but um, I appreciate um, interpreters who made this session possible to be um, bilingual. Last but not least, I would like to thank all participants all over the world. I hope to welcome you to discuss um, the role of the constitution in the corona, um, in the post-corona era, someday at the Tsukuba Science City, the largest science city in Japan. Thank you very much. I hope you, we keep safe. Thank you very much. Bye.